So they are two separate components or offices. Uh, but we always talk about their budget together because the INA budget is classified. So we combine it with ops and we just put out a number. And that way you don't know how much is INA and how much is ops. Ops primary, um, primary asset or operations that they do is running the National Operations Center. So that's the NOC. It's currently situated up at the NAC. And they will move <laughs> to St. E's when the secretary moves. Um, so it's a center that's providing real-time operations support and just what's going on in the environment report um, to the secretary. They also do the secretary's daily intel briefing as well with coordination with INA. INA is looking at, um, so DHS has two um, components who sit on the intel agencies. One of them is INA, the other is Coast Guard. Um, so INA is the other one, and it's, it's the intel arm for the department. So it's looking at information and intel sharing um, across the enterprise from other agencies into DHS as well as throughout DHS. Okay, hey, departmental management and operations. Really, two se again, two separate offices. So you have the office of the secretary. And executive management, and then you have the management directorate. So, OSEM, or the Office of the Secretary and Executive Management, consists of the policy, the Office of the General Counsel, Legislative Affairs, so policies and advisors to our, our secretary, and then the management directorate is CFO falls under management, uh, CIO, CRSO, which is the uh, real property CIO, so the CXOs that Burrow was referencing earlier fall under the management directorate. And again, they provide leadership direction and management to the Department of Homeland Security. She's secretary testifying before Congress. The picture down below is St. Elizabeth's. Is everyone familiar with the consolidation project that's going on throughout DHS? So the St. East campus is being renovated. It's a major, a major project. Work between us and, and GSA. GSA is responsible for the actual construction. DHS is responsible for what we call the outfitting of the facilities. The way to look at that is if you took the building and shook it upside down, anything that fell out would be an outfitting cost. Everything else is part of the actual construction. So the phones, the desks, those types of things that we're responsible for. OIG. Can you OIG here? So OIG is the Independent Objective Auditing Inspection Investigation Arm of the Secretary. They remain independent even in the budget process. As well, they have 130 million in resources, 750 personnel, and they are looking at components, missions, functional areas, just any areas to just keep the department and components more accountable in our operations. That's OIG, and, and with that, we conclude all the components overview. Um, do, does anybody have any questions of anything that we covered or discussed? Yes. I have a question um, about the budgeting process. Mm -hmm. um, it seems to me like it basically starts with the component and goes to the department and then to OMB and back and forth. Uh, what drives the priorities for the different entities? Uh, why do they come up with different priorities? So the priorities are driven ultimately by the administration, which can change up to every four years. So it, as Grace mentioned earlier with with our, our our guidance that we should be following, but it just it's in the process of being updated. But the administration is very clear with the department of what their priorities are. That being said, as Grace mentioned, Pass back will receive today. So you're absolutely right. The components submit their budgets to the department. The department then submits that to OMB. OMB comes back to us and says, here's what we liked, here's what we didn't like. And we then adjust. We negotiate with them in some of the areas uh, to adjust our budget to be in line with the administration. Again, so the secretary works for the, the president. She's appointed by the president. That is her boss. We work for the secretary. So. She is our boss, so we agree with the administration's budget proposal. And once we go through all of the negotiations with OMB, there's some give and take in that. 
The budget then becomes the department's budget, and that's what we send forward to the Hill. Clearly, there's some things from either a component perspective or could even be from a headquarters perspective that we may like or not like. Uh, but at that point in time, once we've come to settlement with OMB and the administration, we fully support the president's budget as it goes forward to the Hill. Um, Grace, did you have anything else you wanted to add um, to that as far as the programming? Yeah. So we went through the missions, and these are the missions that are very high level. Underneath these missions, there's a set of goals as well as the objectives that follow that. That is essentially the guiding principles or the strategic guidance that the secretary is issuing to component leadership. So component leadership is going to take that and look at their mission spaces and then also establish their own priorities internally. And that's what's reflected in the components resource allocation plan submission to the department. And the department's leadership council is then taking the secretary's priorities um, and looking at, well, what do I want to resource or what do I want to prioritize in a very constrained resource environment? And they put forward to OMB. And then if OMB's pass back and similar process is when the administration's and the secretary's negotiating their, in their priorities and then their collective priorities, which then goes in as the president's budget submission. Um, and I think in this environment, we do say constrained budget environment, even though it looks like the DHS top line is growing. And, and I think OMB and the administration would also say that we should be very thankful because our top line is growing. And that's true. Where other components did take more of a decrement, we stayed neutral with growth in certain areas. But like I mentioned before, there were very targeted growth in certain areas. They were essentially earmarked dollars for the department. So it's not that the secretary can take Two point some billion dollars, and then disperse it across the department. That additional resources had to go to specific places, like beds, like hiring, like the wall. Um, and so, from the secretary's perspective, it is a constrained resource environment. And she, and like John mentioned, her priorities do flow from the administration's priorities. Um, and and this environment is definitely a lot more political than I've seen in the past. Our bosses will be here. Yes. In a few hours, at 11, 11 yeah. And they will have an entire presentation on that budget process. Yeah. And ask them the hard questions. So as you went through the mission of the different components, um, there seems to be some, I, I don't know how to say it, but like oh, the wow. intelligent area, multiple components have that piece. And so my question is, like, how integrated or like, are all components really working together, or are there overlaps? Because that intelligent piece is like everywhere. Yes, uh, yes and no. So, <laughs> uh, yes, yeah, so components do need their own intelligence arms because component leadership do run their own operations. So, uh, when ICE is running a raid or running their own operations, or when CBP is running a border security operation, they do need they they do need their own intel and operations arm that the component leadership is in command of. Um, we have seen a lot more of integrated operations across DHS. So you but but you're correct in the sense that a lot of it is grassroots. A lot of it happens at the component to component more grassroots relationship levels. Um, so HSI does do a lot of intel sharing. Coast Guard also does a lot of intel sharing. And they do run a lot more joint operations um, than we've presented in this space. I do think that part one of our limitations as, as being a federated agency, so inheriting different components as well as standing up new, is we have very different systems. Um, so system integration is definitely um, an issue. There's also different process. We have a wide range of authorities. So some intel that may be collected through HSI may not be directly used in another type of operations or needs to be concealed a certain way. Um, and, and then we also have multiple oversight committees. So there's just a lot more limitations in that. But um, I do think that is an area of the secretary as well as the former secretary's priority area was looking at just more enhanced intelligence and operations across the department um, as definitely a growth area for us. But that's a correct observation. And, and also on the new common appropriation structure, <clears throat> under um, every component, almost all the operational components has something called an integrated ops 
PPA, so that's the integration within their components, and, and also kind of looking at what is the integration across the HS missions. Uh, what do you play uh, when the government shut down, and then uh, how you decide which company is going to be operating? So, what do you think about? Yeah. So, we are under a continuing resolution right now, as most of you are aware, um, until the 7th of December, and we'll see what happens at that point. Whether we get a new, whether we actually get an enact, enacted budget uh, for the rest of the year, or just an extension of the CR that carries us for another period of time. Regarding the shutdown or lapse in appropriation plan, there is OMB directs that process. So we have that implemented across the components. The components submit to the department what that shutdown plan or lapse in appropriation plan would look like. There are certain categories of personnel, so clearly from a you know, TSA perspective and many of the other agencies for law enforcement, those employees for public safety reasons, need to continue to show up to work. If they're paid by appropriated dollars, their pay may be delayed until we get an actual enactment and they can be paid again. But they still have to show up and come to work. Uh, so they're, given the nature of what we do in the department, there's a large number of our workforce that, even under a shutdown, uh, continues to come in and support the mission. If typically about 24 hours in advance of in this case, the 7th of December, OMB will direct all federal agencies, and for now, since most of them have an appropriation, it doesn't apply to many of them, they would direct us to begin our shutdown operation procedures. Yes? Can you please explain more the differences between mandatory and discretionary funding, and perhaps how other approved and so from a discretionary or appropriated funding perspective, that falls, there's, there's congressional spending caps that occur that Congress has to comply with and we as the federal government comply with. So appropriated dollars sort of fit in the what's left bucket. Uh, mandatory spending, I believe DERF and some of the other ones that are, they are not appropriated but they are required by law. So, those, do, those don't fall under the same type of restrictions. In fact, if they're under a, under a shutdown, if they're employees that are paid by other appropriations that are not part of that appropriations process, then they continue to get paid, uh, even though they may be working next to somebody who's paid from a, an appropriated pot of money that has not been enacted yet. Yeah. Um, another way to say that would be looking at every year when Congress has an appropriations process, what they deliberate on is the discretionary funds. Mandatory is a set amount that's been established around a period of time that's been enacted into legislation and it goes until that legislation ends. So like Social Security or those Medicare, those are also mandatory entitlement programs. So it's a set amount, so those are not deliberated during the annual congressional budget process, but it's already been established for the next, so the TSA 250 mandatory amount, it's been established for the next until when they stood up, it was stood up for about 20 years. For 20 years, 250 goes to fund this. And so they, so congressionally, they're not, they're not really appropriating that. They're just appropriating more of like what we call the discretionary funds. So it's at the discretion of Congress. Yeah. Yes? Earlier, when you were talking about PPD, you said an office moved up under management, but I couldn't hear which office that was. The Office of Biometrics Information Management, OBIM. Oh, okay. So they're the biometric inventory as well as the vetting and adjudication system for uh, DHS, their primary customer being CBP. Um, and with CISA, their mission focus being more on cybersecurity and infrastructure and under this new organization that has currently been in legislation to move to management and there's been a team that's been set up to establish where within the management directorate that would go. So are you, you sound like you said it was a done deal. Um, yeah. Is it, but what, is there a date for it to take effect or is it already done? Or um, so I think it was essentially effective immediately when that bill was signed and was signed. Uh, but we're also working on you know, a transition plan <laughs> so we can actually transition the people and the resources and the process so there is a conflict of effort. So 
you get CDP and ICE, both of them have customs enforcement responsibilities. Border Patrol would be just that. The borders and ICE would handle any immigration customs issues, maybe interior to the country. You would never see CBP performing a raid in Kansas, so to speak, but ICE would. Yes, so ICE also does interior enforcement, right. and that's where ICE's authority lies, and uh, CBP's border agents uh, operate between ports of entries. Um, but, so when there are national security events like the inaugural, Address, we do call from other agencies and they get deputized to be able to operate within DC. Yeah, but interior enforcement falls within the ICE jurisdiction, essentially HSI. Um, but if somebody's apprehended between a port of entry, then they will then be sent to an ICE facility and that's how they can. Can I ask a question? Yeah. I imagine several people in this room work on their own component budgets. And they uh, furiously get that together because there's a deadline that, to submit it to the department. What happens when their budgets get to the department, both at the budget division and then the longer range look that maybe PA and E takes at? So components plans are submitted to PA and E. Uh, PA and E is looking not just at the budget year, but budget year plus four. So we look at the FISA and we do make. FISA programmatic decisions. Excuse me, what's FISA? FISA is the Future Year Homeland Security Program. So it's the five year look at your changes. So when I talk about Secret Service and how their campaign spikes every four years, we want to be able to program for that. When we're looking at Coast Guard acquisition programs and they need to recapitalize, we want to be able to program for that. Or if they're hiring spikes or increases, we want to be able to program for that. Not just for today, what 20 budget will look like, but what's the cascading impact of that into 22, 23, 24. So if I buy a system today, well, how much is that gonna cost me three years from now? And, and those are decisions and those are information that senior leadership needs to be able to make on um, their decisions. And so we tee all these elements up for the Deputies Management Action Group, DMAG, and eventually the secretary is the final authority on her budget submission, and then it gets passed over to budget shop too then run the budget building process. So then, so, he, so at this point, components submit, the secretary has decided, now we need to build very strong justifications so we can fight for our resources as we compete with other agencies and just the U.S. government top line. This may be uh, maybe for the next, the next session, but has the department given any thought to multi-year budgeting, or, and I don't mean like this, but uh, multi-year funds? instead of these annual one-year appropriations where here we are in another CR, we can't start anything, no who starts, contracts stand in jeopardy, rolling funds, you know, two-year funds, three-year funds, five-year funds, where, you know, I can still, if I was able to budget and save money last year, those funds could roll over to things I know I have this year, instead of it just the mad scramble at the end of the year, to spend everything I've got, or we're not going to get it next year. It's in my years of being in the organization, even when I was active duty, it just seems like a really poor way to manage money. I would definitely agree. It's a challenging way to to manage funds. We do have some multi-year accounts, so there are various components that. Right, I've, I've worked with the acquisitions. I know yeah. that multi-year money, but ultimately, agency wide or department wide. Ultimately, Congress controls the purse, and they want to have that discretion on an annual basis. Um, as you know, members change, the majority and minorities change between the, the various chambers, so as that occurs, priorities change, and they want the ability to go in and realign their priorities. So again, we submit our budget through OMB, and then it goes to the Hill, and the Hill takes a look at our budget submission and. They make changes to it to, that are more in line with what their priorities are and, and where their priorities lie. May not align in all cases with the department's priorities, but ultimately they want to maintain the ability to determine, especially for those discretionary funds, how, how they're spent. One of the downsides of the multi-year appropriations, which you're probably familiar with, is quite often Congress will look at what we're carrying over 
that carryover balance from one year to the next and say, well, you carry it over to, you know, I gave you 50 billion or 50 million and you carried over 40 of it, so clearly you don't need all of those funds, so I'm going to reduce your budget in this year. It also can be used if the department has emerging requirements that come up in the year of execution and we need funds to cover enforcement operations, whatever it may be. We will look as well at multi year accounts as a source to be able to take funds. We, uh, you know, lower levels of the of the agencies had that ability to carry over some funding. Don't just oh, yeah. appropriate the money every year. That's fine. If I could carry over what I didn't spend last year for things this year, you know, an example for us in the Coast Guard was hurricanes. You know, we don't we don't have a line item in our budget for hurricane response because you can't budget for things that may or may not happen. Right. So we. We eat that cost. We hope that Congress, you know, provides us a supplemental. Sometimes they don't, and our other programs state that. Yeah, definitely efficiencies to be gained by by doing that. Unfortunately, the construct we work under doesn't necessarily allow us to do that in most cases. I believe we're out of time, um, so I'll turn it back over to Merle and company. John, if I could just do one follow up, I think it'd be useful for the audience. Um, when the components make their annual um, budget request, what's the integration process like here at the Department of Health? So, we currently use, and this could be a long conversation, so I'll yeah, try and keep okay. it short. you got two minutes. But, <laughs> um, we use the system right now that, to collect all of that information. Ultimately, the budget submission that we send forward is roughly 4,000 pages long. Um, However, we design specific templates that follow the common appropriation structure that we put in place a couple of years ago. So that whether it's OMB that's looking at it or whether it's Congress that's looking at it, structurally it's all the same so they know whether they're looking at TSA or CBP or ICE. I can go to the procurement or the acquisition chapter, I can find this information. I can go look at my operations support and I can find this information. So we collect it up and it's about 88 chapters in total, and then the system that we use puts all of that together the way Congress wants to see it, and we produce the, the budget. We do not print the budget that goes to OMB that's sent electronically. We do print the budget that goes to the Hill as well as provide it. How big is that? Uh, yeah, four very large binders. Yeah. So about 4,000 4, pages roughly. Wow. And in the future, we're moving towards a PPB one number. Oh, put a plug in for that. Yeah. Um, yeah, so it's, it's, it's a system that's meant to integrate the programming and the budgeting and, event, and the execution as well as the performance measures uh, within the department. So that's been an effort that's been ongoing. And we're looking to deploy maybe next year or the year after that. Um, but part of a lot of inefficiencies is you, you give me information and then we make a decision. And then you guys have to re-enter that information for that budget process. We want to be able to integrate it so we can trace that dollar, what that original request was, and what was the ultimate decision, what went to OMB, what did OMB do to it, what did Congress do to it. So it should be more of a one-time entry data point um, across that list. Of, so that's the one number. Great. Like, hey, John, Grace, thank you so much. I think it is great um, introduction to what the rest of the day.